This movie's great because when Sam Jackson goes, he's standing there, you know, we all have to come together and oh, he just gets eaten. <laughs> Hi, my name is April Boyle. I'm a marine and environmental scientist who specializes in sharks and the founder of El Porto Shark. And today we're going to review some shark attack scenes in film and television. So come on in, the water's great. This clip is from Jaws, directed by Steven Spielberg. What kind of a shark is it? Let me see, I don't know. I think it's a McCall. Got a deep throat, Pratt. Yeah, well, but what kind? What kind of shark? It's a tiger shark. A what? A what? I love this scene because it is a crack up. The fellas around don't know what kind of shark it is. They've allegedly been in the water their whole lives. They're watermen, they're fishermen, they're boaters. They don't know what kind of shark this is. That First of all, that's really silly to me because if they've been in Waterman their whole lives, they know what a tiger shark, a white shark, a mako. It's not mako, it's mako. I think it's a mako. So they're pronouncing things incorrectly and that's not something lifelong watermen would do or water women. But in this case, the scene has water men. But the fact is that the bite radius on this animal is different than the wounds on the victim. The thing about bite radius, there is something to that. Often when a shark bites a surfboard, a boat, any Thing, person, you can figure out how large the shark was based on the size of the mouth. So there is something to the bite radius thing. Look, fellas, let's be reasonable, huh? This is not the time or the place to perform some kind of a half assed autopsy on a fish. A necropsy is actually what it's called when you do an autopsy on an animal. And to do an animal necropsy, you certainly wouldn't do it on the dock unless you had a lab or a setting next to the dock where you lay the animal out and you do it properly by weighing and measuring. So back when this film was made, they absolutely would have put the shark on display and said, look, here's the man-eater that's been terrorizing the beaches. However, today, fortunately, that's not the case in the US and many other places where sharks are protected because since this movie came out, there are 75% fewer great white sharks in the ocean, largely because of fear, misinformation, and movies like this, but fortunately this movie is what inspired me to grow up to be Matt Hooper, so it did good. Peter Benchley, who wrote Jaws, is a marine conservationist. He spent his life as a conservationist for sharks and the ocean. Didn't realize what a bell he would ring with this one, and the film was just so good and so suspenseful it made us all afraid of sharks. This clip is from Deep Blue Sea, directed by Rennie Harlan. How long have they been synchronized like this? So the whole lab setup and genetically modifying sharks, that is pretty absurd. I can't imagine anyone funding that for starters, making sharks smarter. I can't think of a reason to do that without doing other research first. So the whole notion of genetically modifying sharks to be smarter and work together and mind control. This reminded me of the Aquaman cartoons when I was a little girl where he would just telepathically get animals to do what they wanted and I think I bet the writer's an Aquaman fan too. Tell me I didn't see that. They recognize that gun. An interesting thing a lot of people don't realize is that sharks are skittish. Most wild animals are skittish. They all have personalities and you'll come across some who are curious and others not so much. Generally though, a wild shark is skittish of something that's not its food or it hasn't seen. For example, it would not recognize that there's a gun pointed at it or that a person is doing something in its harm because that's kind of not part of its world. I myself have been surfing, and because a great white shark can't see directly in front of them or directly behind them, as soon as it turned to touch to see me, it was gone, just super skittish. And I've seen this behavior with all types of sharks, nurse sharks, black tips, reef sharks, hammerheads. I've had more of them swim away from me than I've had come toward me. sure what he shoots into the shark to make it just pass out like that and go up and all that's really silly so it's kind of not feasible at all this is I would say this is 
almost 100% fiction. Next and I'm still starving. We almost had that of feeding friends. Oh, come on, let's get this over with. This is Finding Nemo, directed by Andrew Stanton. Right then. The meeting has officially come to order. Let us all say the pledge. I now am a shark, not a mindless eating machine. If I am to change this image, I must first change myself. Fish are friends, not food. What I do love about Finding Nemo is they try to portray a different side of the shark with the fish are friends, not food. I can't tell you how many students have said that to me because of Finding Nemo. And I think that's great because it's showing that, hey look, the sharks are trying to care, we should care, and I think it's trying to send a bigger environmental message, but showing you that sharks can be quote unquote humanized to where they're coddly or friendly, which is why conservation is hampered because they're thought of as eating machines, killers, etc. So this humanization, if you will, I think was great because it kind of gave kids a less scary intro to sharks in a way that wasn't so much like, yes, they're going to eat you no matter what. Now, do you all have your friends? Got mine. <laughs> a lot of sharks have very symbiotic relationships with other fish. You'll see pilot fish and you'll see remora stuck to the bottom of sharks. So those are both kind of really great symbiotic relationships. The pilot fish and the remoras are not part of the shark's food. They don't think to eat them. So they hang around and get protection from the shark and pick up scraps. They're very specific eaters. Great whites, hammerheads, everyone, they have their specific niche in the ecosystem. So they don't just eat everything. So they do have relationships with other fish. That's mine. Get Dory, it. Cut it out. Get me. Ow. Oh, oh, are yeah. you okay? Ow, ow, I'm ow. so sorry. Uh, you really clocked me there. You want bleeding? Oh. Ow. <laughs> Dory, are you out? <laughs> oh. Oh, that's good. Intervention! The little yes. tiny bit of blood that goes into Bruce's nose and he inevitably is drawn into a frenzy, which is one of the best shark myths that scares everybody. And I have to say, I've used it to my advantage before to get people out of the lineup surfing. Oh, you have a cut, you better get out. More waves for me. But honestly, if I could cut my finger, stick it in the water, and have white sharks or any other shark come to me, imagine how easy my research would be. How easy it would be to attract them. The truth is, there's a whole cacophony of smell out there, and while sharks can detect a small amount of blood in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, that doesn't mean that's what drives them to go and eat. Great whites in particular are very picky eaters. They don't simply eat everything. It's a little more complicated than that. They're not just indiscriminate eaters. Yes, tiger sharks and bulls are sometimes known as garbage cans of the sea and they'll eat everything. White sharks, far more picky. So every shark has its specific food. And again, we have another clip from Jaws. So the shark in Jaws is a great white and we do cage dive or use cages to observe great white sharks in the wild. However, most of the time the cage is attached to the back of the boat. There are those that go down by themselves farther into the water, but they're not as flimsy as it appears. The shark simply bumped into it and the cage falls apart. It's far safer than you think. And interestingly, I have never seen a great white or any other shark attack like that. It seems like in movies, they're made to like act like a dog. I've seen them like take something and nur, or like keep going and uh, 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 and that's just not how a great white shark feeds. So the shark is un a bit unrealistic, quite a bit unrealistic in the film. Now, if the shark actually did get in the cage and present a danger, he could feasibly go down into hide in a coral area in Southern California. You can hide in kelp bed maybe, you can hide in some rocks. So that's feasible. I, that part is more believable than the shark. Marcel, we have a real problem here. It is not a problem. It is a circle of life. This is Couples Retreat, directed by Peter Billingsley. The circle of life is circling our lives right now. Do not move. Do not panic. Oh. Shark! What? Shark! 
Jason! Okay, it's all happening, Marcel! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Don't no worry! Their reactions are so over the top and unnecessary. It's absolutely fantastic. And I've actually seen people afraid of tiny sharks. Now, the fella in the movie calls them lemon sharks. They look like they're in really tropical, beautiful waters. And I've seen lemon sharks in that water. And I actually have a video of one coming just as close to me and minding its own business. So those little guys were checking them out and would absolutely do no damage to them. Sure, there's times where you'll hear a shark has bitten a foot or taken a nibble off of somebody, but the way those little guys were, I mean, honestly, they were in no danger whatsoever, and if that was my guy out there, I'd be like, okay, we need to sit down and have a talk, and I would take him cage diving with 18-foot great whites to get that fear right out. He said not to panic! He said not to panic! I'm sitting in blood. I'm sitting in blood. Marcel, this isn't a drill, buddy. You got real sharks here. It's time to get the guns, and it's time to shoot some fish. So let's talk about the word attack. It is used in a lot of situations where it isn't actually human and shark interaction. You can go to the International or Global Shark Attack file, search it online, and download the Excel file yourself, and see that sometimes a bump and run as I said, I was bumped by a leopard shark. I was never in any danger. It was turbid water, trying to figure out if I was food or not. Boom, wasn't it left. That would be classified as an attack. Nothing wrong with my wetsuit, nothing. This also may be characterized as an attack and there has to be something done about that and there are some researchers, including myself, trying to get rid of the crazy attack scenario where everything is an attack and not just an encounter. So I had an encounter. These gentlemen are having an encounter with these sharks. This is not an attack. The one actor dumps in and leaves Vince Vaughn there with all the blood really is a non-issue, but Vince Vaughn should get out of the way because it's there's little bits of food in there that they were feeding the shark. So it's not necessarily the blood's going to attract them right away and everything. But if there were bits of food in there, you know, get out of the cloud of food, dum dum, just, you know swim a little bit, but they really weren't in ever in any danger, so uh, they were just letting all their fears hit the best of them. This is The Meg, directed by John Turtletop. This is allegedly a big uh, research thing of some kind, the shark would already know it's there. Not only does it have lateral lines, so lateral lines on fish are those things that they go down the sides and it allows them to feel vibrations. And sharks have this, and it's why, you know, you'll see schools of fish schooling. They can feel the vibration of the other fish and by vision as well. So vision and the lateral lines, their ampullae of Lorenzini, these are all things that allow them to hunt. And their vision is not that bad. So if it was dark, if it was turbid, meaning there was a lot of particulate in the water, a lot of wave action, sure, something could happen. But this thing in the water should have been there for a while, and this big, ginormous shark trying to take a bite of this tiny little girl is incredibly silly. I mean, if there were a whole bunch of kids, like you got a whole bunch of potato chips I could see going by and tasting one, but for the shark to do that, that was that was pretty absurd and something I don't think would happen. In the Meg, it's really ridiculous. The shark would try to bite that glass where the little girl is because if you recall, the shark came from way down deep in the Marianas Trench and had never been up above a certain layer. So this shark would have really bad vision because you don't really need vision down where there's no light. You hunt by other means, etc. Your vision doesn't have to be that great. So the fact that it was dark around there would have nothing to do with that shark eating that little girl or trying to eat it. It would not go after it because it certainly doesn't look or sense or smell or sound or feel like any food it's ever had. They'd be afraid of it. It'd be away from that. Next up, we have Baywatch, filmed right here in beautiful Los Angeles County. So they definitely had 
have a lot of fun filming this. The entire thing is an homage to Jaws. When Michael Brody was in the pond with his little kid friends in a boat and they got knocked over, all his friends swam away and he sat there and the shark went by him just like in this. So the writers of this, to me, this whole clip is just a fun, we really love the movie Jaws and we're going to be as absurd as possible and make up all kinds of nonsense about a shark attack. The whole absurdity is, I could see everybody, shark, oh my god, out of the water, out of the water. I could see people panicking and that happening, but I can't imagine a lifeguard getting in the water where the lifeguard boat is right there and could get to them far quicker because when you're trained to be a lifeguard or a first responder of any kind, you don't kill yourself to save somebody else. You have to make sure you safely save someone. It's part of their training. The fact that life Guards, especially Los Angeles County lifeguards who are part of the fire department, they're incredibly trained, would run out into something that was dangerous like that if, for real, that little tiny shark that looks like a dolphin in some shots was actually going to attack. If there was some real danger right there, they would bring the boat over there. Now the other silly thing is, okay, she swims out, she gets to him, Turn the boat over, get on the boat, get your limbs out of the water if you're so worried about them. But really, just swim calmly to the boat because the shark isn't going to keep coming after you like that. And the other homage to Jaws was when Jill does get eaten and she's taken through the water and just the top part is out. That's just like the very beginning of the very first Jaws where Chrissy, if you remember, she's screaming, oh, it hurts, it hurts. And you know, and then she lands on the buoy before she goes down in it. So this was a giant love letter to the movie Jaws. Just as over the top absurd, probably a really fun shoot to do. This is The Shallows, directed by Wame Colette Sara. shark in this movie is supposed to be a great white shark. They're picky eaters. I've witnessed myself them accidentally taking a bite of something that wasn't their normal prey and spitting it right back out. So the notion that they would fight so hard to get this small morsel that is not calorie dense. Again, in the wild, survival means calorie dense meals. Which is why they love seals and sea lions because their blubber is not like human fat. It's super dense. It's a whole other organ, which is why it's called blubber and not fat. I don't care how big and fat a person may be. We're still not shark's food. They don't want you because you look like a big meatball or whatever. They want the calorie rich food because they don't know when their next meal is. So it's like any other animal in the wild. You waste a certain amount of energy to get the food. So the amount of energy that shark wastes jumping out and hurting itself is not worth the payoff if it got to eat her. The shark going up on the rock and in the coral, probably being pretty abrasive on the animal. So movies where the shark comes up and is bite by, it's just not their behavior. I've never seen that happen in the wild and I've seen that meat stuff in the wild with my own eyes. This is Open Water, directed by Chris Kentis. Are you okay? Are you okay? Oh, no. So Open Water is the most frightening movie out of all these movies today. So it's based on a true story. Two divers did actually get left behind on a dive and they were never found. So the movie is speculating kind of what they went through. I mean, I'm getting chills thinking about being left behind on a dive boat. That is the scariest part of this movie. And anyone who's a diver, research diver or commercial diver or just for fun, that is the most frightening part. Ah! Ah! I can't see. And then the next most frightening part is the little shark bite and how this happens is actually on the feasible side. The shark took a bite, it's like, yeah, this isn't my food, and took off. So that makes it really feasible and believable, which makes it entirely frightening. And the fact that divers do get lost on dives is a thing that happens. Unfortunately, this clip is very feasible. It could definitely happen with the certain conditions. So it's the most realistic. 
This is Beat, directed by Kimball Rendell. So sharks don't feed at the top as much as previously thought. In fact, a paper just came out about this very recently. They spend more time down below, being that their food isn't on the surface. However, if a shark was going to come up and take an entire person, it would be very quietly, much like that fella that just was swimming and whoop, he's gone. But I don't know what that explosion was afterward. I'm not sure what that was, but I could definitely see someone being dragged down if the animal thought that was food and took the person in. But again, we're not their food, so we don't look like their food, so it's really unlikely. So sharks in South Africa and other places actually come up from the bottom and surprise attack. I've actually seen them do this in Guadalupe Island, Mexico with my own eyes. Looking at one shark, behind you another one goes up and grabs something. So they do come from the bottom and just, so that's part of their strategy. Go swimming everybody, did I scare you enough? But at any rate, they took the shark jumping up out of a natural behavior that sharks in South Africa and other places have done to get seals and sea lions. So that behavior is something that they over-exaggerated for this clip. But once the shark ate the guy, he probably realized that's not food and probably would be so excited about this guy. Again, it's all a big, absurd, really quick, oh my god, there's a shark, he's eating everybody, and it's perfect for the movies. So we've seen a lot of clips with shark attacks, a lot of encounters, things called attacks that weren't attacks. And we have to remember, using this language to say attack makes the sharks a villain. And really, they're a top predator of the ocean that keeps the entire ecosystem in check. And they need our protection. In just one hour, over 11,000 are killed. If there's one thing you can do to help sharks and the whole ocean ecosystem, is stop using single-use plastics and especially straws. What's the alternative? Look. Oh my God, I drank something without a straw. You can do it too.